Uh, regarding the difference, uh, the differences in the way the oncology community and even the guidelines and practices treat uh, similar type of data in a different way, the reasons are not exactly clear and there is not one particular reason. It's always a combination of many factors. Uh, for example, in case of uh, pancreatic cancer, it could be, one of the reasons could be that yes one is a Japanese drug and it was a Japanese trial conducted in Asian population and the Western population or the Western oncology community is not very open to those data. Uh, that can be understandable because previously there were some reports of uh, differences uh, depending on race or ethnicity. But uh, uh, what I propose is at least we should do the same trial in European population and check because the data from the Japanese trial was very impressive. Uh, overall survival gain of 21 months. Uh, but we see that uh, this has not made into American guidelines or the European guidelines. Uh, but uh, gemcitabine plus capcitabine, which is more toxic uh, compared to S1, uh, and uh, the benefit of overall survival margin is not very large. It has made into all the guidelines and is recommended as a category one recommendation. So this is a discrepancy, this is a difference in treating similar data in a different way and the reasons are um, what we call, there are many reasons but one of those reasons could be in this particular case could be the not invented hair syndrome. So those drugs that are not uh, invented here are not trialed in this population. Uh, we are reluctant to those data but I think the way forward is to conduct those trials in the local population and test if it gives similar results. So we should be more open to data coming from other parts of the world. Yeah, again, the factors can be many, but in this particular case, uh, I think one important uh, reason is the power of uh, advocacy groups and public education. So breast cancer comes with a big uh, public uh, importance attached to it. Everyone, is, everyone gives more importance to breast cancer. But when you talk about lung cancer, the importance is uh, given a bit low in the community for many reasons. One could be probably due to its association with uh, smoking and the stigma associated with that. Uh, and uh, other, other factor could be women cancers are uh, for a good reason, they are given more priority. But the thing is lung cancer should also be given more priority and more people should be talking about it. We should educate people more about it. Uh, and I think that that's interplay of various factors is the reason why lung cancer is screening despite having good data that low dose CT screening prevents mortality among high risk smokers. It is not being practiced widely, whereas mammographic screening, despite limited data, is being widely advocated. Uh, that's a very interesting question and thank you. Yeah, what I, what I propose is a center for sense in oncology. That is what I say. And uh, it uh, will act on various uh, aspects such as patient and physician education uh, will be one important aspect of that and working on uh, co-development ideas and drug repurposing ideas. And as I said, there will be a lot of people with different levels of expertise uh, with uh, uh, various uh, comments, different comments on those ideas. But I think a central uh, network of healthcare professionals who are experienced and independent without any conflicts of interest, and they evaluate all the input coming from various sources, I think that will be the way forward. Uh, well, I think uh, I'm not proposing to replace pembrolizumab with a web-based application, but what I'm trying to say is we can have some very effective but cheaper interventions. Pembrolizumab is a good drug for lung cancer. Uh, there is no question about that. But we can also have other cheaper innovations that can be widely applied uh, 
throughout the world and that doesn't need any any big instruments or any uh, expensive technologies and that can give you a similar magnitude of impressive survival benefit so, but the problem is this type of strategies are not uh, they don't belong to one particular company and uh, any industry cannot make a lot of money out of it so they are not being widely implemented so we should be working on such technologies that can be widely implemented and we can uh, save many lives with such simple steps so the question is not uh, uh, replacing one with the other but of course integrating both and supporting more and more study and research on such type of uh, simple innovations that I call cancer ground set that can be applied everywhere. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. I, I put forward the example of statin in small cell lung cancer in order to compare that with, uh, for example, ipilimumab in small cell lung cancer or bevacizumab in small cell lung cancer. All these three examples are examples of failed trials. Ipilimumab failed, bevacizumab failed, uh, statin failed in small cell lung cancer. But the way we, we look at these three drugs are different. Ipilma failed and the editorial mentions that although Ipilma failed, maybe it will be effective so we should keep doing other trials in various combinations. Bebasizuma failed and the editorial mentions although it is non-significant, it is improvement. And statin failed and the editorial mentions statin should not be trialed in any cancer. So the way we look at these cheaper drugs and the way we look at expensive drugs are different. We have similar data, but we are optimistic about the expensive drugs, but we are pessimistic about the cheaper drugs. We need to put them to the same level of uh, evidence and the same level of judgment. Now about uh, your question regarding why we, are, uh, use, why we keep doing big phase three trials for, exp for expensive drugs without having good phase two data to support that. I think that's a very important question and that's one important concern that we need to address in oncology and this is a big problem. Uh, one important reason is because now, until now the, all the approvals are not based on value. Most of the approvals by the FDA and EMA, they, are, uh, they, they don't take value into account. They don't take the margin of benefit into account. So if it is statistically significant, uh, they just uh, give approval and you can price the drug as much as you want. Uh, if the drug improves only two weeks of survival or the drug improves two months of survival, uh, 20 months of survival, you can, the, the price that you put on the drug does not depend on the benefit. So everyone is trying to get their drug approved. So even a small margin of benefit is okay. So they are trying to chase that small margin of benefit with a huge number of patients in an overpowered trial and that will help them to get the drug approved. I think that's the reason why despite not having good uh, preclinical or phase two data, everyone wants to go to a phase three trial so that if they get lucky with one blockbuster drug, then it, it will be equivalent to billions of dollars. Yeah, I very much think so because the way the drugs are priced now is unsustainable. No country can afford these drugs at these prices for a long term future. So there has to be a point where we should act. And another important thing is if we keep on approving the drug that have very marginal benefit, then the industry will not have the desire or incentive to produce better drugs. So that is like uh, giving uh, compliments uh, to a student who gets grade C in exam. So he will never work hard to get grade A. So we want grade A drugs, but currently we are giving compliments to a drug that has grade C. So we should definitely put value into the equation and we should be asking more from the drugs that cost so much because uh, no country, no matter how rich the country is, can afford these expensive drugs uh, at this uh, level of benefit for a long term future. Uh, yeah, definitely. Immunotherapy are a good class of drugs. There is no doubt about that. 
but uh, the problem with immunotherapy is uh, they benefit only a small number of patients, but those patients can derive a long-term benefit. And that is definitely there. But the number of patients they benefit is small. So what I'm trying to tell, it, uh, tell about uh, this class of drugs is, in public, they have a huge hype. And public has a very big hope from immunotherapy class of drugs. So sometimes I see patients with ovarian cancer who come to me and say, doctor, I need nivolumab. So there is no data to support that finding, but public has has been under the misimpression that if you get immunotherapy, then all your cancer will be cured. So first, we need to clear this misimpression. And second, we should definitely uh, try new strategies to improve the response rate. Uh, we need to search for a better biomarker because PDL1 as such is not a good biomarker. So we need to look for better biomarkers to find patients who benefit and to uh, find patients who don't benefit from the drug. Uh, but another important thing we need to keep in mind is the cost of these drugs because these are very expensive drugs uh, with severe financial toxicity and some uh, actual uh, lethal uh, physical toxicity. So we need to always keep in balance about the harms of these drugs versus the benefit in a small number of patients. So I think the key step for us is to find a good biomarker so that we know who benefits and who don't. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, I actually uh, like uh, this topic uh, because I have come from Nepal, which is a low income country. And I have my experience of oncology in Japan, which is a high income country. So I have seen both, the, I have both the experiences of working in a low income country and a high income country. And I have seen the difference in those countries firsthand. And the difference is quite big. Now, regarding Moonsat, uh, it was a very ambitious project and uh, Moonsat focusing on immunotherapy and precision medicine, uh, attempting, uh, the attempt is to Im improve survival. Uh, someone even dares to say cure cancer. But uh, the data that we have about immunotherapy and precision medicine are sobering. They are, we have some success, but it's not as dramatic as it was proposed to be. Now, I want to compare that with cancer ground sort, uh, which I call as uh, the research and study and application of tools and methods that are applicable to everyone uh, in, uh, living in Earth, no matter where he is living. So these are the strategies that include, uh, just for example, if we take the case of cervical cancer. Now, we can focus on how to improve access to bevacizumab for cervical cancer, or we can focus on providing HPV vaccination to everyone in cervical cancer. So if we provide HPV vaccination and uh, cervic uh, cervical cancer screening, then no patient should die of cervical cancer because this is a cancer that we can actually prevent, we can detect early, we can cure early. But the discussion will be about how to provide bevacizumab to advanced cervical cancer patients, which I think is illogical because no patient should reach up to the stage of advanced cervical cancer. And this is an example of cancer ground shot project. If we can provide good vaccination coverage to everyone throughout the world, then there will be no patient who dies of cervical cancer. But now let's compare that with immunotherapy or precision medicine, and we are spending billions of dollars, and we are getting only a couple of months of survival benefit. So this is a huge gap in our investment. So what I propose is if we can, let's say, spend only 5 to 10% of what we are planning to spend on moon shots, to ground shot projects, then probably we'll be saving more lives than Moonshot will ever be able to save. And that, that, that's an excellent question. And of course, I don't have uh, uh, a simple answer, but uh, as there are so many players working on global health, like WHO, UNICEF, uh, UICC, especially in this case, uh, UICC, WHO, IARC, and other not-for-profit organizations that have global reach and that are working on global cancer control. I think all these organizations, including ASCO, ESMO, uh, organizations that are involved in cancer care, should work together and channelize these funds to implement these strategies that are more valuable to saving lives 
than other strategies that are only uh, useful for prolonging life. Of course, I'm not here to discredit prolonging life. It is important. As everyone wants to live uh, longer. We need to have research, cutting edge research on how to develop new therapies. But we should balance that with simple steps that can save so many lives but have been ignored.